Sure. All right. So I'm here with Helen Shulman, my former neighbor on the Upper West Side, now far distant, but we both have books behind us. So, you know, <laughs> I brought the Upper West Side to with me to Brooklyn. Um, we're talking about Lucky Dogs, which is a new novel that she has just written and it's coming out um, very soon. And what I'd like you to do, Helen, please, is to read the first couple sentences of your author's note up until the sentence, I thought my head might explode. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I understand that feeling. Um, sure, I'm happy to. As a teenager in the 1970s, growing up during the height of second wave feminism, I truly thought things were only going to get better for women. Just as running around barefoot on the first Earth Day, I considered myself lucky to have been born in an era when we committed to protecting the environment. Well, we all know how that worked out. <laughs> Five decades later, I'm furious on the best of days, and like a lot of women, I still feel demeaned, underpaid, overworked, overburdened, and hypersexualized. When all the Me Too stories broke, Weinstein, Cosby, Lauer, ad infinitum, I was so angry, I thought my head might explode. Okay, so there we have the impetus for this book. And I'm going to say that any book that begins on the Ile de la Cité at my favorite Bertillon is a book that I'm going to tear through immediately, even without all the Weinstein references. Tell me about how you came to this book. I came to this book because I was, I'm a news junkie. I couldn't stop reading about me too. And I came to this uh, little tidbit of information that um, Harvey Weinstein through David Boyes, David Boyes of Bush and Gore, David Boyes of Theranos, David Boyes of Gay Marriage, a complicated American man hired on Ehud Barak, Ehud Barak, the ex-prime minister of Israel's um, suggestion, a spy from um, an agency made up of ex, of ex Mossad agents to destroy and silence an actress who was writing a book about how Weinstein had raped her. And suddenly, like the whole monstrosity of Me Too became so clear in my eyes that you have this international cabal of like the wealthiest, most rich and powerful men all ganging up on destroying this young woman who had been raped. Um, and it made my head explode. Yeah, well, uh, I have to say, I met Rose McGowan at a dinner party, like right before all this happened. And I found her smart, engaging, um, interesting, um, kind of brilliant in her own way. And when I saw what happened to her, it felt like it was happening to all of us, right? It felt like a second rape. Well, she was, she's a complicated figure and my character is not her. Right. The idea that they would all spend millions of dollars trying to destroy her, ruin her career, um, just stop Wonderful. her from writing a book is so ludicrous and so cruel. And it just shows that, you know, when these mass rapists, it took a village for them to be mass rapists, right? They, they had all this power and money behind them and a lot of collusion and a lot of fear and a lot of um, very scared people. Yeah. but also people who just really wanted to make money and be powerful and couldn't care less. So yeah, it just infuriated me. Uh, well, I also, I also loved the way that this is not just a story about that, but it's a story about a woman betraying another woman. Nina betrays Mary. Well, that's what animated me. I mean, the idea that you you could hire a woman or I think it was a couple million dollars, I'd have to go back in my files, to befriend another woman, to befriend her because of your supposed um, allegiance and support for 
uh, women's rights and to protect women from sexual abuse, um, to gain her confidence, all to destroy her. When the subjects rape, that just flipped me out. I mean, I actually remember talking to my editor who I adore, Jennifer Barth in the beginning. And I said, how could one woman so utterly betray another woman? And she said, how well, how could one, some person do it? And yet in my stupid, naive mind, I, have, I thought if there was ever a sisterhood about something, it would be about sexual abuse. But of course oh. we know it's there's none. I mean, we no. have, you know, and you live through it and there are co co collaborators like Ghislaine Maxwell and, you know, Harvey Weinstein had many people ushering those girls in and out of his hotel rooms. And it, the world is very complicated, but for me, I really wanted to understand why this one woman could do that to this other young woman. And that became the quest of writing the book. And then she, well, I don't, I don't want to give away too many plot points, but can we talk about where Nina is from? Um, that she's from Sarajevo, right? Born in Bosnia, yes. Right. She's so born. that part also okay, actually I want to get I want to ask a separate question. How did you how how did you describe Sarajevo so well? Did you go there? When in wow. fact I started writing about it um off of research. I'm like a really crazy researcher. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wanted to go. I had a Guggenheim, so I had time. Nice. I pitched this is another naive really dumb thing I did I pitched a story to um Jackie um Jackie Gifford at Travel and Leisure the loveliest woman on black travel black travel is when you go to war-torn areas and places where terrible things happen and you try to re-experience it it's this whole kind of travel that's been big now for a long time on the internet and and Jackie very sweetly wrote to me back and said, well, what about a um, luxury adventure travel trip to <laughs> Bosnia? So I said, sure. Well, there sort of is no luxury um, travel in Bosnia, but is a beautiful country. And I spent time in Sarajevo and I interviewed a lot of people and I went, they have these homemade war museums, the Children's War Museum, or another where it's basically curated um i guess by people who run the museum but everybody just brings in their pictures their artifacts their letters their toys what remained there there are you know their living documents and um it's a very you know it's what is it it's 40 years now um it, it feels like the war was there yesterday i mean oh. there's still buildings that are you know smashed and um, have trees growing through them, and right. um, no, nobody spent a lot of money rebuilding Sarajevo the way they rebuilt Berlin or you know cities in Japan. It's just been cobbled together. And what you have once again are the these people who lived together for thousands of years, kind of just fine, sort of, right. um, then turn on each other and killed each other's grandmother and. Yeah, no. Right, mm -hmm. their wives, etc., and now living together again. And yeah. I remember just saying, "How can you do that? How can you possibly live together again?" And they were like, "It was four years. We have no choice." Yeah. So I mean, you look at any war-torn place. You know, years later, Germany. You know, Jews and Germans living together in Germany. Like, what? You know, what are you going to do? Um, this is kind of a departure for you in terms of fiction, right? I mean, this is a thriller in, in many ways, uh, and it, and it was a page turner, and it was, and I don't want to use the word masculine, but it has this sort of masculine uh, energy to it, even though it's a book that is incredibly feminist. Was that on purpose, or did, am I telling you something that you hadn't thought of? I don't know the masculine part. I know that it is my first sort of thriller, but my books have been increasingly more and more about how we live now and how we live now has become increasingly more intense and crazy um, as I get older. So um, like my last book, you know, there was a, a big part of it how it took place in Fukushima, Japan, and a lot of it was in Silicon Valley and it was weaving together a lot of political and I guess social criticism as well as like what I hoped was a good story. 
Right. Um, this one was more so um, yeah. because I was presented with spies. Yeah. You know, I had, I had, and I had two characters, both very cursed by beauty, I would say, mm -hmm. really beauty being part of their downfall, but we're young and beautiful and smart and talented and their lives were destroyed and they get locked into a kind of battle to the death, even though they're very, um, oh, I guess the word would be attached in some way to each yeah. other. Yeah, there's definitely a sort of an umbilical cord attachment to, between these two women. I mean, I would even say like the opening scene where the men touch her hair. I mean, how many times have you experienced that? How many times have I experienced that? These tiny little microaggressions that we deal with, that women deal with every day. You write in the book about, um, I think it was in your, it was either in the afterword or in your, in your, um, in your author's note about you know, having never seen an erect penis, uh, a, a flaccid penis until you, like, cause you always saw erect penises on the subway. Like these things just happen to girls and young women all the time. But I want to get back for a second to women betraying other women, because for me, that has been the case in so many ways. I think back to even, you know, I wrote a book, Shutter Babe, my first book was about rape. It had a rape in it. And I was befriended by a journalist who who seemed to become my best friend during the interview. And then in that interview that she wrote up said, um, I asked her if she's worried that her, um, that her, I forget, I asked her if she's worried she's gonna be called a slut. And also poo-pooing my rape, my very traumatic rape as a bad choice on my part. What? A bad choice on my part to go to uh, go into that room with him, and I, you know, what I found fascinating about this book is that you made this. It's kind of like female betrayal writ large, and that has not been the case for you in your life. Have you find that women? Have you found at in your you know years of working in the world of men and women of writing that women have been supportive of you? Because I have found the exact opposite. I've had both. Yeah. I mean, I had, you know, I, I think back to when I was at graduate school at Columbia and Joyce Johnson was a mentor to me and she went out of her way to help young women writers when nobody gave a shit about young women writers. Right. I mean, really, there was like five minutes that people gave a shit about women writers and before they turned their, lot, their attention to, you know, the injustices of for white writers of color. And, um, you know, but, but back in the day, nobody cared. You had, your name was Jonathan or you were nothing. Right. Um, your name was Jonathan. <laughs> so Joyce was very good to me. And I, that was great. I mean, was everybody? Probably not. Right. No, um, I've had nice mentors too. I mean, I've had wonderful female mentors and that does not take away from, from their mentorship. But I found, by and large, in the literary world, particularly in the world of criticism and when a woman is assigned to write about you or your world, I have found unfair treatment, I think, in in many of those domains. And it's... it's well, for years, we were all screaming all the time about how we weren't being reviewed and we weren't being the reviewers. And you would go through the TBR and it would all be men interviewing men and they would all win the award. I mean, there was a sea shift in that. And, um, you know, I'm old now. I'm, what, I'm 62. I've been doing this since I was 26. Yeah. Um, and I've lived through a lot. I wouldn't say, though, that um, there's a whole lot of parity. There are people who have broken through um, much more so than before. But in academia, it's been really hard. I'm still trying to get pay parity at my university after all these years. Um, you run the program, the the fiction program at the new school, right? I do run it, yes. The, the, pro, the fiction program, I'm not the director. I've never wanted to be the director right. and I've never been. So we have had one female director for an interim year. Um, otherwise we've had three male directors, but as I say, I never wanted to be it and I would not go up for that job. So I like what I do. I like having 
um, the intimacy I have with the students I have and the other teachers and planning and thinking of programs. I don't like budgets. I don't like bureaucracy. Yeah. I, you know, I do everything I can to not be on committees, though I'm often put on them. Yeah. Um, in terms of getting back to the book for a second. Um, so it was so good, right? I, I really think that this is going to be a bestseller. And for my mouth to God's ears, hopefully, it's really, really intensely good and insane ride. Um, I know that you teach in France in the summer. Did that sort of influence um the 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 where the opening scene took place uh, they, i did i do not i no longer teach in that oh. program though i've just started one at parsons paris which is part of the new school where i am so actually i'm going there next week for our okay. inaugural summer but yes i did spend many years teaching in paris and so it's a city i know very well mm. and um i love paris but I've been there. I was there during Charlie Hebdo was five minutes from my house. I was there a couple of weeks after the Baklavan shootings. I've been there during the Julie Jean. I've been tear gassed. I mean, I've seen Paris and it's it's best and it's worst. And in the heat with the rats and with all the um, migrants in the city. And it's a very complicated place. And I love it. Um, but Paris, Paris is not the same as Paris. Right. And Holly, it's like Hollywood, Hollywood is not the same as Hollywood. Right. So it was a great place for there to be both an underbelly and all this beauty. Right. And what so other research did you do in terms of, um, because a lot of this seems incredibly well-researched. Did you talk to Ronan Farrow about his work? Did you talk no, to I any of his journalists? What? I just read it. I read yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm. I'm actually like I just was assigned a piece, and and the editor kept saying, "Well, you have to talk to somebody." And I'm a phone phobe. And I'm a shy. I'm. A, I'm a reader. Yeah. Um, but I did read everything I could find on it. I read everything I could find on the Bosnian War. I read everything I could find on the Mossad. Um, I went to Florida. The Florida stuff was great too. Yes. Florida. And my best friend from high school's got a home in Florida and he slept me all across the state and we really had fun. Um, and I, I had planned to go to Israel, but because of COVID, I never could get to Israel. So that was all researched. But a friend of mine, Rebecca Sachs, who's an American who writes about Israel a lot, introduced me to this wonderful writer, Benjamin Ballant, who lives in Israel. And I sent him my pages and he, so he could just vet them for me. Oh, great. Make sure that I wasn't wrong because right. I knew when I started writing my Sarajevo section, I was all wrong. And when I came back from Sarajevo, I had to throw out everything I had started. Um, so I was worried about that with Israel, but um, I think Israel turned out okay. My, my research assistant, this year is a young woman named Maya Moverman. Her father is Oren Moverman. Oh, yeah, I know Oren. Yeah, yeah. So, and she told me, no, you got Israel, you got the Israelis. So that made That's me great. Feel good. That's really, really great. When, um, the book comes out June, what again? When does the book come out? June 6th. June 6th. Okay, great. Oh, so you'll be in Paris during that time. I will be. I'm there for from the 31st through the 12th. So I'll be away the actual date. Right. But I don't think it really matters what happens that day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to discuss about the book? Um, I don't want to give away too much plot. So I'm sort of holding back because I think one of the one of the pleasures of the book, and I read it without knowing nothing without knowing anything. I didn't read the afterward first. I didn't read, you know, I just I just opened it and experienced it the way that anybody that would come to it without having read a review or anything. So I don't want to give away too much plot, but is there something that I missed that you want to discuss about the book? I just hope that you thought it was also funny. It was very funny. Oh yeah. Well, actually what I do want to say is you got the kind of Gen Z millennial talk down pat, you know, the way they say me and my friend, you know, at the beginning instead of, my, you know, my friend and I, um, all the Argo. So did you get that from your kids? I think I get it from teaching. Right. You know, I'm with young people all the time, which is great. And I love them and they keep me fresh and, and they, they, they wiggle into my brain. 
Yeah, no, they're they're definitely there. I could see the youth in the. I mean, it's a first. The it starts off with first person, then it goes moves to this. What is it? It's called second person with a U. But anyway, the first person part where we're we're listening to Nina, the the joy of it is actually the humor and the language and the way that she speaks like you know my kids who are 28 and 26 less so than like my my um my gen z kid but yeah yeah no it's just sometimes when i'm talking about the book it just sounds so dark um and there're definitely dark things about it for sure but i also think i hope that there's part of it that's kind of entertaining well, also more than just entertainment, like there's a there's a section in there where she talks about sort of stalking people on Instagram. I mean, it's like something that we all do and you've described it in this way that I've never heard it described in fiction before or even probably in nonfiction. It was this kind of the way that we can find out about people very easily these days by sort of going to their you know, their Instagram feed and poking on like who are their friends and finding their friends and going to their Facebook. Like you can learn so much. And, and, and Nina, do, sorry, not Nina, um, Mary does learn so much just by, or she thinks she learned so much. And that's kind of one of the twists that I don't want to reveal. But, um, and again, the fact that the spies set that all up so that she would look for it. I mean, what do we think about David Boys and all of this? I mean, I personally, I'm sure David Boys will be hurt to hear disappointed in him I am, but boy, am I disappointed in him. Um, you know, I thought he was, look, I'm a naive person. I think the best of everything until I'm pushed in my face like a pie. Right. But yeah, I mean, the whole Theranos thing, this, this horrific way that he protected Harvey Weinstein, who is a monster, and a pig, and look, Harvey Weinstein raped, oh, I mean, Canaletta suggests it's close to 100 women. All these people aided and abetted him. Yeah. I mean, you just don't, you don't get to do that by yourself. No, you have to have a machine around you. And we discussed before I pressed um, um, record, something that I can't even discuss here, but you know, I know what it means for powerful men to silence women without the means to fight back because it has happened to me. And I can't say anything more than that, but it is horrific to be silenced, horrific. Well, there really should not be, um, you know, uh, those, the things that people sign. I'm NDAs, yeah. NDAs, they shouldn't exist. Well, I am doing my darndest to figure out a way around them, but um, at this point, um, speaking out costs millions, so you can't. You know that's and that's and that's how the system is set up. You are NDA to the point where you can't speak, and I have to say it eats away at your soul, day by day, eats away at your soul, because especially if you're a storyteller, like in the book, um, in in your novel, Mary's a storyteller, like I am for my living, a storyteller. To silence a storyteller seems to me the worst kind of crime. But people are so vulnerable, they sign. People need money, they want protection. It's not about even needing money, it's about well, not wanting your money to be taken from you because it's 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 this sort of Damocles risk of financial ruin, um, less than needing money, you know? And, and you live with that sort of Damocles your whole life. And again, I can say nothing more. So that's that's the story. But listen, I want to also just thank you. This is a great book. Um, I love it. And I'm proud of you for having written it. And I want to ask you one really dumb side question, which is that, do you walk down the street and ask and people ask you if you are me? Because I get asked if I'm Helen Schulman, I'd say like five times a year. Really? Yes. I'm so honored. <laughs> well, I'm so honored too. <laughs> I mean, no, nobody has ever asked me that. But you ask me all the time. <laughs> so funny. People ask me all the time. I'm like, nope, we just have that Jewish look, honest. Jewish girl look. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? They don't even ask me if I'm Helen Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very invisible. But that's that's a great compliment. Yeah. 
younger than me too. So I'm really going to live on that one. Yeah. I'm 57. Yeah. I'm, you know, five years younger and I get asked often, are you Helen Shulman? Nope. But thank you. Cause I thank love her work. Well, it's um, so nice to see you. Yeah. It's great to see you too. Thank you so much for um, talking to me and have a great time in Paris. And I'm actually going to be there for my boyfriend's 60th birthday we're leaving on the third so i'll be there at the same time but we're gonna head straight down to aix en provence to do like some nice. bike trip. that sounds like a great birthday yes i'm really excited I'm really yeah excited. Good. all moment. right i'm going to i'm going to press on record and then we can chat for a moment and then hold on a second stop recording